this is the third year of our Racism in America Forum, which was organized mainly because we wanted Vermonters of all colors and ethnicity to talk with one another. Because Vermont is the whitest state in the Union, we felt that there were a large number of, of white Vermonters who needed to know what it is like to be a person of color and what are the encounters and experiences they have. And so the Racism in America Forum was an opportunity for Vermonters to talk with one another on the topic of race, the history of racism in this nation, and also how Vermonters and Vermont as a state uh, was complicit to that institution and also fought against it. So this was a form by which we can talk to each other regarding one of the topics that America has most difficult, is most, has, most, has the most difficulty in, in addressing, racism in our country. And so we have been, we have been fortunate to bring together co-sponsors such as the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and Mount Mansfield Community Television in not only bringing this forum to the immediate vicinity of Jericho and Underhill, but bringing it actually, uh, allowing it to be broadcast in various parts of, of New England. In fact, uh, at our last forum, uh, a person all the way from Japan uh, uh, came into the, uh, logged into the, into the forum. And so it is now an international broadcast and so we're, we're very fortunate to have this opportunity to, to share the concerns and, and the hopes that people have regarding race in America. Well, some of the topics that we have addressed uh, in this forum uh, concerns the origin of racism in this country, uh, how, it, uh, how it has spread throughout the nation, the, the means by which uh, African Americans and people of color have continually been oppressed and why it exists, what are the systemic um, um, legacies of, of racism in, in our country today. Uh, such such uh, other topics that we have uh, addressed included the legalities of racism, um, housing, for instance, and uh, Jim Crow, the, uh, the continuation of racism um, after, this, after the war and after, the, after slavery. Uh, some of the topics we're addressing this year will, uh, will involve the, um, black entrepreneurship, uh, especially in Vermont. Is there, is there a, a possibility for black entrepreneurs to, to work within this state? Um, we are, have also addressed the issue of uh, Burlington declaring racism as a public health crisis. We will be addressing the concerns that people of color, especially students of color in this state have growing up in rural Vermont. What is it like? What is their experience? So they will be sharing some of that. We'll be talking about uh, policing in Vermont, um, uh, people who represent different sides of that argument. Is, it, uh, is there a possibility for reform of, of, of policing in this state? So there are a number of topics that we will address in previous years, we have mostly addressed issues of racism as it affects the country. This year, we're focusing specifically on Vermont. So this is the third year of the Racism in America Forum, and one of the areas of concern that people especially have, especially resulting from the most recent presidential elections, is that there is this huge divide between people who voted for Trump and people who voted for Biden. And, and some of those divides center around the changing demographics of our nation and, and, and fears that whites may have about that change and how can we accommodate in, in a peaceful and constructive and productive way uh, to, these, to this reality. And so there is a great need for people to talk about race and how we might reconcile our differences in light of these enormous divides that keep us from talking to each other and with each other. And so this, this year we'll really focus upon efforts to try and um, bridge those divides in our conversations and in our concerns. And so uh, we're hoping that you will continue to be a part of this effort.
Good evening, everyone, and I apologize for the inconvenience, but we wanted to make sure everyone who needed to be here has access to this forum. This is the December 1st Racism in American Forum, focusing upon racism in Vermont. This entire year-long series is going to focus on racism in Vermont. My name is Arnold Isidore Thomas. I'm fortunate to serve as pastor of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Jericho, Vermont, which is one of the sponsors of the forum. The co-sponsors of the Race, Racism in America Forum are along with Good Shepherd, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and Mount Mansfield Community Television, which video records, broadcasts and archives these events. So if you wish to know the topics that we've discussed as far back as the beginning in the fall of 2018, please click onto Mount Mansfield Community Television website and it shall it will tell you everything you need to know. The forum was created so that Vermonters as residents of one of the whitest states of the union may have an opportunity to talk with African-American Vermonters and other Vermonters of color around issues of racism, systemic racism, other forms of bias and bigotry and how individually and together we might overcome these problems. Today, we are pleased to welcome two students, two African-American Vermonters and students of Mount Manfield Union High School who have spent most of their growing up years in this section of Vermont and who will share their experiences of growing up black in rural Vermont. They are Daniel Allard and Serena Sawyer. Serena, by the way, is um, an 11th grader at Mount Mansfield Union and the student founder of Cougars of Color. And we'll get to hear from both of them shortly. By the way, Cougars of Color is an organization, as I mentioned, that Serena founded, uh, a racial equity group comprised of students of color at the school that provides a safe haven for students of color to share their thoughts, hopes, and concerns. And if there are teachers and administrators representing schools in different parts of our state or in New England that lack such organizations in their schools, I encourage you to work with students of color in starting one within, within your school. We are also pleased to welcome, and I think she's here, the faculty coordinator of students of color, Spanish teacher Gretchen Hogan. I'm also glad to welcome, um, there are several members of the Vermont State Police, um, including Lieutenant Robert Lucas, commander of the Vermont State Police Barracks in Williston, who has been a strong supporter of the forum since its start back in 2018. These are the rules of engagement, everyone. We will devote the first portion of this meeting, hearing from Serena and Daniel, sharing their experiences of growing up in this section of Vermont, some of the challenges as well as joys they have experiences. We will then allow for questions and observations or insights from you, our listening community. If you have any questions or comments, please write your name in the chat box and uh, we will either raise your questions or allow you, unmute you and allow you to, to raise your questions your, yourself or make your observations yourself. Now, before we before we begin, before we hear from the students, I, I want to read some remarks from an individual who could not join us, also a, a student of color. He was unable to attend. And, um, and so I thought I'd share, I, I let him know that I would share some of his remarks. Um, his name will remain anonymous 
for for security reasons. But this is what he what he has to say. Oh, and by the way, you should also know that part of his remarks will include racially offensive language that was directed at him. And I think you should hear it. And in this context, it would be appropriate for you to hear such language so you can understand the ugliness that exists within and among us. You should also know that uh, those of you who were raised in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, the term Negro you probably thought was an appropriate and a respectable reference for African Americans. But around the mid 70s, it ceased to be so because African Americans felt it was more important for them to claim, identify, and name themselves, refusing to be named and identified by others. So as a matter of courtesy and for your own personal safety, I urge you not to use that term along with other terms such as colored. This is what this Vermonter of color and student had to say. I moved to Vermont in the summer of 2019 so I have recently, I have relatively limited experience as a person of color in the state. But here are some of my experiences from the last year or so. Also, I've only recently grasped my racial identity about four years ago because I've lived in white households all my life. So the racial prejudice I may have, I may have faced before that, that the racial prejudices I may have faced before that, I just disregarded as a rude person being rude. During the late spring and most of the summer, I would go on a run. I used to run this one route where I would pass a house of someone who is known as a far right conservative. I soon realized that every time I passed this person's house, this person would come outside and sit on the front porch, slamming the door on the way. I thought it was strange at first, so I just assumed that this person had some type of routine and would sit on the porch with a cup of coffee every morning. However, when I ran by the house on the way back home, this person gave me the same angry stare and didn't break eye contact. By the time I ran maybe a hundred yards away from the house, I would hear the door slam closed again. It really felt like I was being watched. This happened maybe seven or eight times before I started running a different direction. Also, when I would drive by this house, I never would see anyone sitting outside. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but I certainly felt like I was being watched out of suspicion of stealing something off the yard. This person's yard is like a year round yard sale. Another story I have is when I was in Costco and I was just standing in line with my cart full of groceries waiting to check out. And I hear someone's parents or guardian say, come on, keep moving. And this kid who couldn't have been older than 11, says, I can't. There's a Negro boy in my way. I turned my head so fast, I could have gotten whiplash. I made direct eye contact with this kid, and he didn't see anything wrong with what he said. And I looked at his mother, 
or woman who was taking care of him. And she had a similar look on her face and said, oh, I guess there is, oops. And she asked him to walk around me. I participate on an athletic team and kids say the N word on a painfully regular basis. So often I actually felt inclined to make a video about why saying the N word was bad. And my teammate who was helping me make the video actually said it twice. It was so frustrating because he obviously wanted to help, but he didn't see the issue with saying it in the first place. When I lived in another state, some kid who I think went to my school yelled, hey nigger, Trump 2020, out the window as he drove by. Trump had a rally maybe 30 minutes from there that same week. I lived in a number of places before moving to Vermont. So I will say that Vermont is light years ahead of many other places with taking action toward racial equity. I feel comfortable enough to go into stores and businesses alone, which is a luxury I didn't have in the previous places I lived. However, recently, the racist acts just seem so much more blatant, as if racists are no longer afraid to be open about their racism. Let's move on. Daniel or Serena, would you want to say a few things? I mean, I've had a relatively similar experience to that. This is Daniel. Uh, yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm the sophomore at MMU. Um, I've had a relatively experience. I've had a relatively similar experience to that. I mean, I've only had really half of year of actual in school high school because of COVID nineteen ending my freshman year early, and I haven't. We've been doing it. Uh, co-curricular that thing um and i was at first i it kind of happened like in the beginning of freshman year i had been going to school for a couple days and then one day i heard the n-word thrown around the next day I, and then it, i didn't hear it for a while and then i heard it again and i progressively started becoming more and more aware of how much it's thrown around that's oh phenomenal Daniels, uh, are you yes, still there? Uh, yeah. Hello? Uh, we lost you there for a second. Yeah. So uh, even uh, even kids in my own friend group who... Uh, my friend group is rather relatively diverse, I'd say. I have another African-American friend who... Is, there's another African-American friend in there, and there's one who's uh, also not who is also, I think he's Romanian, I believe, but like, it's, uh, we had, we kind of had to sit down and talk to them about why it wasn't okay to say that because they had never, they had always known that it wasn't necessarily a great thing to say, but they never understood why, I guess. And we, I didn't realize that it wasn't common knowledge why it was not a good thing to say and since since then we have worked it out but i was just kind of astonished at how frequently it's used i think a big part of it is that a lot of people don't understand how like how offensive and bad it can sound i think they a lot of people will throw it throw it around lightly without thinking about the uh impact it has on those around them so yeah I mean, I feel like I've had a rather sheltered-ish um, life because I've been, I was, I mean, like, 
I guess I was only really aware. I only really learned about racism in like fourth or fifth grade, Mm -hmm. which was, which I feel was pretty late, but I mean, I live kind of in the middle of nowhere. So I wasn't exposed to very many people, like a lot of people, because it was kind of like a tight knit community around where I live. So everyone knows everyone. But uh, as I started to grow older and move out into, you know, MMU and bigger places, it did become more and more apparent, I guess. Like, it's just, I feel like sometimes I feel as though there are small aggressions that are made. I'm not, I can't pinpoint any right now, but it's, there's always kind of a feeling of uneasiness when I hear like racial slurs around me. It always makes me very uneasy. So it just kind of has that kind of effect on me. I mean, I don't know if that's just me, but. Thank you, Daniel. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I'm, I think that I've said everything I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from Serena and then we'll, we'll raise whatever questions or observations we have. Serena. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was really excited initially when you first invited me to speak here. Um, Growing up black in Vermont was, I was so excited to be a part of this that this conversation was happening. And then I think a few weeks after you had told me about it, I I got really nervous and really um, sort of panicky about it because, because growing up in Vermont, I would never really describe it as black for me. Even though I am a black person, I, it's not how I would have described it. And I think I was trying to find a way to put that into words. Um, and I came back to the idea that Vermonters, Vermonters have this, um, Vermonters have this idea that equality is synonymous to being the same. So treating everybody equally is to ignore people's differences. And when you're someone living as the difference, and when you're someone living as the other box, being having people ignore differences can be kind of tough. Um, and so I didn't really know how to answer the question. And I think I think I just sort of settled on this idea of racial imposter syndrome, which I looked up. It's an actual thing. Um, Because here, as we all probably know, white is the norm. White people are the expected. And that was really tough for me to try and figure out at first, because I, comparative to a lot of darker skinned people, I pass really, really well. And so people expect me to be right, white, sorry, right off of the jump. And and it always just sort of created this, this idea of unease and unwelcomeness in, in the situations that I found myself in. And I think a good example of that is um, my mother. And my mother is dark skinned or darker skinned than I am. And, um, and when I was little, I was obsessed with her hair. I thought her hair was the best thing ever. And I got, I freaked out when she wanted to cut it because it was like my mom's hair and it was so cool and it didn't look like anybody else's that I ever saw. And then I got older and I sort of realized that nobody else's mom or nobody else had that look about them. Nobody else looked the way that we did or that she did. And, and everybody who knows or who has ever dealt with a teenager knows that everybody sort of goes through that phase where it's not cool to hug their mom anymore. It's not cool to like hang out with them in public anymore. And I experienced that too. And I think a part of that for me definitely was knowing that that we didn't look the same that ever we didn't look the same way that everybody else did. And it became kind of a point of shame for me. I started like straightening my hair every day so nobody would see that it was curly. I I just stopped talking about it because it was easier. Everybody treated me like I was white and it was easier to pretend to be that way. And I had the luxury that I could pretend to be like that. Um, 
and I've and as I have I've begun to talk about this more, I've begun more I've begun being more comfortable with it and I've gotten it's I'm it's a point of pride now, obviously. But but it was tough to be the other person growing up and and the need to constantly validify um, myself and whenever I would try and have a conversation about race, the first 15 minutes of the conversation still today are spent trying to validify that it is okay for me to be having this conversation, that I have the right to speak on this. And, and I think we spend so much time trying to force everybody to ignore differences and to ignore the way that we the way that we look the way that we talk the, our different experiences that we we completely um what is the word invalid invalidate them and um and so yeah i was very intimidated when you first asked me to speak on growing up black in vermont and i decided to try and break it up into adjectives as opposed to black because that's a word that i had trouble identifying with for a long time um and so one of the ones that i chose was confused so growing up confused in vermont for me <laughs> um is highlighted by a week in middle school when i was in the cafeteria and like one of the four one of the four black kids in in my middle school like middle school grade um he had a couple of white friends and him and one of his white friends came up to me during lunch one day and were like you know you're not black right like i've heard you say things like that you know you're not black you're just not look at yourself you're not black and then i was kind of like okay cool i'm gonna go back to my lunch but thanks for your input and then um that friday we had a school dance and every school dance um every school dance i get asked by at least five people for an n-word pass so that they can sing all the words to their favorite songs without feeling guilty about it and the friend the white friend that had come up to me and told me that i couldn't call myself black asked me for an n-word pass at that dance and i was so confused <laughs> and i think that that's a great example of how how growing up for me sort of felt. It was like, I felt constantly conflicted with myself and whether or not I had the right to call myself this because I didn't feel right when I heard people talk about being white, it didn't seem like what I was doing. But I also didn't fit this idea of black culture that a lot of people have. And I think when you have an area that is so purposefully whitewashed um, when you have an area that had such a strong eugenics program, I think it's really difficult to form this idea of a black culture. And, and I don't know what it is. I've never experienced, I've never lived outside of Vermont. So I couldn't tell you what, a, what they're expecting me to be like when I tell them that I'm black, but it's just, it's not what I am. That's for sure. Um, and so that was always confusing for me. I always had I always had trouble with that. And I think as we talk about it more, we get more comfortable with, um, I get more comfortable with, sorry, my being black in Vermont and saying that I've grown up black in Vermont. But, um, but I, think, I think if we try to continue, sorry, I'm blanking on the word, but I think if we try to continue forcing this idea of normality to whiteness, which I know we're slowly moving away from, especially as the media has hooked onto the issue of police violence this summer. Um, I think we are, I think we're gonna move, I think we're gonna move closer to that idea of a culture that, that I think so many African-American people in Vermont seek just try and validify their experience, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yes, it does, at least to me. Um, you wanna say anything more, Serena? Um, no, I think I'm good. Thank if that you. was confusing, it's confusing to be 
black in Vermont. So, <laughs> well, if it's if if it was confusing to anyone, we will allow time to clarify for 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 people who need that that time. Um, before I open it up to conversation, and again, I'm asking people to put their name in the chat box. If you have any questions, we will um, we will either raise the question or or uh, unmute you so that you can raise the question. Um, by the way, um, I just want to make sure certain individuals are are in the room. Um, Angeliki, John, yes. has uh, Helen Clonaris, has she been admitted? I saw her in the waiting room, wasn't on my list. Um, let me see if she's in there now. Um, she may have just gone to the YouTube because we sent okay. that link out. Okay. Yeah, she, she was on the wait list, but not there now. I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, It's it. I, I imagine that it is rather difficult being African American in Vermont, and African Americans certainly encompass a wide range of complexions. Uh, we can we can be our our skin color can be so light that we we easily pass for white, or it can be dark or darker than myself, and and. I imagine because of that, that, that wide range of diversity in complexions, um, that, that confusion probably, probably exists among African-Americans throughout the state. And especially when there, we are not in great number, when we are surrounded and overwhelmed by, uh, by whites and the state is identified as one of the whitest states in the union. In fact, right now it is second only to Maine as being the whitest state in the union. So that confusion that Serena mentioned and, and that sense of trying to find <clears throat> himself that, that, uh, that Daniel mentioned, I think is common among, among people of color, specifically African-Americans who find themselves in a very small minority trying to make sense of who they are, what they are, and how that identity relates to, to the greater number of folk that they encounter. <clears throat> I, was, I was interested, um, Daniel, in, 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 your, um, in, your, in your reference to the commonality of the N-word that has been used and, and Serena, of your, your friends asking for the end pass. That's, uh, that's something that's somewhat amusing and somewhat concerning to me. But let's, uh, let's uh, open this up to conversations. Are there any questions that people wish to raise? And we, we have one chat, one request on the chat uh, for Serena. Uh, to talk a bit about uh, more about the organization that she founded, Cougars of Color. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> an organization is a strong word for it. It was it started as a club, um, and it still is a club, but we're trying to widen it to the community currently. Um, it started as us recognizing that a lot of the equity groups in our school. Um, though they existed, we had student action committees and that sort of thing. Every member in it was white. And that can be difficult when you're trying to raise awareness for a community that you're not a part of. Um, so we decided to make it a, sort of an affinity space slash equity um, area for students of color. And it got started last December, so a year ago, um, we got started. And, and it's been really positive so far. We were able to put on a pretty, um, pretty successful rally that um, Pastor Thomas, your son, spoke at. And it was amazing we were able to put that on. And um, 
and we've had we worked on getting the Black Lives Matter flag up at our school. Um, and we're really looking to work more closely with the administration on the curriculum. Um, our school board recently founded an ABAR um, group, which is the Anti Bias and Racism Council. I believe that's what they call themselves. And um, and we're beginning to cross hairs with them. So we're hoping to really get into the the curriculum going forward and make some changes there. Yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. Other questions or observations? There are a few more in the chat. Can can you read them? Um, uh, Aline has a question. Um, would you like to read your, she can speak for herself there? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Aline Twinkowski and I'm from Hartford. And one of the things that I'm working with is the superintendent of schools and the school board, as well as the town. And I'm curious if either of the two students, if their schools have uh, diversity instruction and inclusion, uh, what do the classrooms look like? What are on your walls? How much are the others part of your daily school environment? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't want to step on Danielle's toes. I'm always nervous of doing that during Zoom. But um, I love this question. I would say they're essentially non-existent on our walls and in our, in our um, not promotion, but in our school depictions. Um, there was recently a flyer that went out and it had a young, like a little black boy. He was African-American and probably four years old and he had big curly hair and weird glasses on. And I think the poster said like, um, if no one is being kind, be the one who is, or something like that. It was for World Kindness Day. And, um, and people were really upset about it. Um, not because, not because that the school was representing an African-American kid, but because they felt uncomfortable with the way it was being used. And, and I don't wanna get too much into the specifics of the situation because I didn't fully understand it to be honest, but um, but it caused an outroar is the point. It, it totally shifted my email inbox and people were really upset about it. So if that goes to show anything, um, no, we don't, we do not represent, um, we do not represent other colors well currently. And in terms of the literature that we're reading, um, we could definitely improve. There's one in the freshman English, um, in the freshman English, they switch out books. It went from, I believe it's Story of a Part-Time Indian to um, The House on Mango Street. And that's like the ethnic book and like the exotic book that you get to read that year. And then going on from there, 10th grade is all Homer and classic ancient white men. Um, so we could definitely improve in that sense. And I really appreciate all the work that you're doing towards that. So thanks. Thank you, Serena. Uh, Daniel, would you have anything to add to that? Um, well, I guess one thing that did stick out to me was it wasn't a super big thing, but in my math class, um, one day my my friend, one of my friends, well, I'm not, uh, not going to name, but he asked one of my friends and I to stay after class, and uh, apparently he had been taking one of the classes that teachers take, I don't know what they're called, um, about racial diversity in school. And I thought that was a pretty cool concept, but then I heard the questions he asked, and though they did ascertain to what, like, he had pulled us aside for, and they made sense, it didn't really feel like what they were trying to teach was about diversity in schools it felt more like it was just it felt more like 
it was kind of saying what common knowledge is. It was asking questions that didn't I didn't feel needed to be asked. Like if you were speeding in a car and got pulled over, would you get a ticket? And he asked that to both of us. And I understand why that kind of question was to ask. I just, I feel like the way people are going about it may not be necessarily the correct way. Like the way it's being addressed might not necessarily always be the correct way. If that makes sense. Yeah. Would you, did you feel uncomfortable answering that question? Uh, no, because I feel like, I mean, a big, con a big uh, contributor to why I didn't feel uncomfortable was probably because the other person that he had pulled aside was one of my friends. But mm -hmm. uh, when I mean, it, but other than that, if it was somebody, I may have felt uncomfortable if it was somebody random that I didn't know at all, uh, who just kind of, he just, who was from a completely separate class. I had no clue who they were and he just pulled them in. I probably would have felt uncomfortable in that situation, but because I knew who I was there with, it made it a lot better. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Other other questions? Victoria yeah. Ramos has a, um, a uh, on a chat. I yeah. she went this. I am. Is this this? Yeah. I am a school board member from a yes. small school in New Hampshire, and I'm wondering how I can start bringing anti-racism to my school community. I would like to implement an anti-racism policy too. I also am a person of color who grew up very confused in my mostly white town. Let me see. My mostly white town in Illinois. I get it. I think she's resonating with what you said, Serena. I am so glad to hear it. Not mm -hmm. that you were confused, but that you get it. Yeah. Um, I I wish I could give better advice on this one. I am by no means an expert into school policy. I just joined the school board this year. Um, I think I've seen um, effective I've seen effective measures begin um, on select boards with I'm trying to remember the word for it like a pledge to be anti-racist and anti-biased. If somebody it starts with an R, if somebody knows the word for it, I'm completely blanking at the moment. But um, just sort of like a pledge. Um, can go a long way because then you can hold a resolution. Thank you, Bridget. Um, a resolution because at that point you can begin holding people accountable. Um, I don't know how effective that would be in a school board, as I've never tried it there, but I imagine it would. I imagine it would work. Um, I wish I could give you more, Daniel. Anything? <laughs> yeah, no, really. I looked at the question, and I. It's a great question, but looking at it, I was like, man. I had no clue. Yeah. But you would you would encourage um, schools to start some kind of organization that addresses racism within their within their schools. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I also, I've been playing with this idea in my head of like, um, this might address a question later on too, I don't know. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions about being an ally recently and um, with everything going on in the media currently, the idea of allyship is something that people at least that I speak to are talking and thinking a lot about. Um, and it's really easy to go about it the wrong way. And um, so I've been thinking about starting like an allyship training course um, or an allyship, <laughs> like an allyship club, um, hopefully led by either professionals or people of color who would be able to properly dictate it um, or not dictate it, moderate it, sorry. <laughs> but um, that's an idea I've been playing with. 
if you want to try and work with that, it might be useful because I think a lot of people want to help, but just don't necessarily know how. That could be a start. I want to entertain some more questions uh, from the chat, but I also have a question that I need to ask. And I think this was also raised in, in one of the questions of the chat. Why the prevalence among white Vermonters to use the N word? What encourages that? I, uh, you, did I cut you off? Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think part of the reason why it's so prevalent here may be because it's such a white state and that there probably hasn't been much of a voice explaining why it's not okay. Um, because when, they're, when people are doing something wrong and no one tells them why it's not okay, they have no reason to stop doing it. Mm. That's kind of the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, if I, 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 I'll try and keep this short, but I also want to um, talk a little bit about the role that Black culture and like Black dialect um, and African American vernacular English, it, it's, um, it's totally infiltrated the way that we talk on social media and the way that we talk online to one another. Um, you'll be in MMU and <laughs> you'll hear kids using AAVE left and right and center and they have no idea what it means. Um, and it's become very hip. And a part of that is because it comes so strongly from black culture is using the N word. And it is um, to some people just as normal as using the word like it's lit or it's pop in or something like that. Um, and I think and I think that definitely plays a role in it, the normalization of that um, in white society. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm inclined to say that certainly in-house language as opposed to outhouse language, there are terms and references that people of one race will make to each other that can be understood as endearing, whereas outside that outside the the outside the community is is easily seen as offensive, which means that only people inside this community can use that term. As in, sometimes sometimes the N word is used as an endearing term among African Americans. I have difficulty with that, but that's a reality but it should definitely not be used outside outside the community. And that's why I think, uh, Serena, you, you have friends walking up to you and asking for the end pass because there are, there are often um, um, uh, rap, rap songs, uh, uh, hip hop that, that incorporates the N word. And so when whites hear that, they want to sing along with it. And they, and they, ask, they ask people of color, they ask African-American friends that if, can they, can they sing this song in, in its fullness and, and use the N word and, and, and ask us permission for them to do so? Well, my response would be no. <laughs> Uh, but but people respond differently. Um, is that is that what you're encountering in in many ways? Definitely, definitely. I'd say um, there's that sort of off limits idea that people have a hard time with. You know, if the door says "Do not enter," you're gonna want to go in it. And I think I think it also has a little bit to do with like sort of like a taboo thing. Like, but. <laughs> without fully understanding the history behind it and fully understanding um, all of the tragedy that, that comes with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's hear some other questions from the group. There was a question way on up from Linda Gray. There's a lot more underneath it too. 
Why, why don't you read that question, Angeliki? Okay, um, let me find it here. Um, so Linda Gray's writing to say thank you to Pastor Thomas, Daniel Allard, Serena Sawyer, and the young man whose statement Pastor Thomas read to us. We're all listening. Most young people in high school are trying to figure out who they are and how they fit in. It sounds especially complicated for Serena and Dan. Can you tell us more stories? Uh, well, I'm also wondering if there are if there are people of color in the audience that would like to chime in and tell some of your experiences. Aline, Aline, you wanna say something? I'm probably maybe one of the oldest people here. I was born in 1948. And when I was born and it's on my birth certificate that I'm colored, um, and then I became Negro at some point and then the early 60s, Black and African American. Um, this probably will be very um, shocking to some people. Um, my race has never been how I've led my life in, in, in my life period. I did not raise my children to lead with their race. Um, my children are fortunate in that they've had their father and I in their lives. Um, and obviously from my last name, my children are biracial. And my husband and I were married in 1966. Um, so our marriage was illegal in many, many states uh, in the United States when we were married. Um, so one of the ladies contributed that language changes uh, when I grew up, um, my father was referred to by a young white child, young male white child, as Mr. N. I'll be nice and not say the word for everyone. Uh, and my father came home and he said, at least he called me Mr. Um, and one of the things that's occurred over the last several decades is there is fragility on both sides on black people's sides, on white people's sides, because words take on meaning that they never used to have, never used to be. Therefore, we don't communicate with one another anymore. And because of my role as chair of a committee on racial equity and inclusion, I try to build bridges. And I understand that people don't understand our history and we have a combined history. It is something that we just can't throw out. And I specifically, I was not raised to be a black woman. I was raised to be a woman. And I was raised with a passion about who I am and the goals that I want to achieve. And I've been extremely lucky in my lifetime. And to the two young people that are here, I want to tell you you will find who you are as you grow into your life. And who you are will be regulated by many things, most of which is which inside of you. I have three children, the oldest is 48 and the youngest is going to be 35. And my youngest is a doctor and she's at the University of Michigan. And I'm sitting here trying to tell you, you can be anything you want to be as long as you can dream it. And don't let anybody take that from you. And I believe that in, in thoroughly, intensely. You know, see the world, experience it. When we can travel again, and I do mean when we can travel again, <laughs> travel, see other people, experience their cultures, because our culture here in this country is intertwined with the other side of who we are. My father told me as a young girl, we are just the carbon copy of white people. And a lot of people would be offended by that. But my father was born in 1926 and used to dance on the corner, on the corner for quarters. So our history is important. And how our history combines with who we are and who we become we're not limited by it, we're enhanced by it. 
And if we are able to show others that we can unite, we are stronger and better because if anyone is left behind, all of us are left behind. And I'm done. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of this tonight. Uh, thank you for opening up your door and listening to me. Uh, but I do have a strong passion. And I'm sorry for you babies there where you live. Uh, I'm in Queechee and in Hartford, and I live in a completely different place. Uh, we're not, we probably don't have as many uh, BIPOCs here as you do there, but our area, we have great strides growing. Our school board did pass an anti-racism policy and procedure. Um, my particular committee requested a year ago an RFP for a strategic plan, which was unveiled this past April. And Hartford is working very, very hard to make sure that racism and inclusion and are things that we're working on. And we're also very, very aware of how poverty affects people's lives. And so it's a big spectrum. But again, thank you. You have other people that you need to have talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, maybe um, Tawanda Geary would have something to say. She has a uh, chat. Uh, she, she's from Quebec originally. And um, um, maybe she's wanted yeah. to elaborate. Yes, can we can we unmute Tawanda? She's. We also have um, Ellen's hand is raised. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, you can go ahead with Ellen if you please, if you want. Since you're since you're on the on the uh, speaker right now, Tawanda, why don't you oh, start up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for joining this meeting, and thank you so much, Arnold, for doing this. I really, really appreciate that. As I wrote in the little comment before, I am from I am. born and raised, uh, born in 1964. And we were the only, my father was African-American from Oklahoma and raised in Kansas City. And he has had, of course, his experiences being born in, in 1942 in those years. And when he met my mother, we have been the only family, black family in the province of Quebec for years and years and years. So, uh, and my mom was white, so uh, I was surrounded by white people. So I can relate to the confusion, Serena, that you talked, you speak of. Um, when I moved to the United States, the contrast was so, so big for me. Uh, I remember telling my husband, what is that focus on color in the United States? My father had talked of it. We had gone through our own pain and suffering. Hi, beautiful girl. I wanted to go back to what you mentioned, Serena, about the narrative and not feeling capable of speaking um, to your own experiences in your environment. And there is, a, as a therapist in Vermont, a therapist of color, um, I have a lot of clients are reaching out to me, a lot of BIPOCs reaching out to me because there are things that don't need to be said um, because we share a commonality of experiences. And one thing that I find that is so common for all is the difficulty in expressing and taking charge of their own narrative from their own experiences in life as a person of color in Vermont. And the second thing that comes into play with that is the discomfort that is experienced by people that are not BIPOCs and that duality going on. Hey, if I speak of my experience, they are uncomfortable and at times, uh, there's a unconscious decision made to um, not want to hear the narrative or choose to speak of your experiences. And one thing that I always say, it is, it is time to just take charge of your own narrative and express yourself as things pop up. 
Uh, I'm with Arnold. If someone wants to use the N word in my presence, that is not an acceptable behavior to me. It's about education and it's about understanding that it's hurtful to so many of us. So education, sharing knowledge, and taking charge of our own narrative as people of color in this, what well, we're talking about Vermont in this state is to me a priority. And I find that it's lacking with a lot of my clients and through education, they're finding their voice and they feel empowered through understanding and compassion, not hatred of history, of the history in the state of Vermont or the country, but with understanding and compassion to use their own voice, to express their own experiences so that they feel in charge of it without the fear of hurting somebody else's feelings. So I wanna thank you again for sharing your experiences to the two young um, students there. Um, I think it's a powerful and enriching to everyone to hear about your own experiences in your school right now. And I have a 19 year old who's been going through some things too. So, and Arnold can speak of that. We had to talk mm. about that last week. Mm. Uh, so, um, and thank you for your counsel on that, Arnold. Uh, it was greatly appreciated. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say, but to me, I have to emphasize how it is important to take charge of our voices without fear of hurting someone else's feelings. No more head in the sand hmm. for yeah. us and for them so that oneness can be and can happen. Thank you, Tawanda. Thank you. There was another person who wanted to say something. Hello. Ellen? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello, uh, hello. How are you? I'm doing fine. Chime in. So for, for people who are watching that don't know, I'm Serena's mom. Yay. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the experiences, I don't know if Serena will, will knows this story. Um, she was in an after school program and the program was being run by a substitute teacher. And us parents were against the wall waiting for our kids to get done. And um, the woman came up to me and was like, oh, what are you here for? And I said, I'm here for my daughter. And she says, I'm sorry, but your daughter's not in this class. And I pointed to Serena and she was like, you can't take her. Hmm. And then all the mothers around, you know, rallied and were like, this is her mom, and you know. But there's a lot of um, sometimes in Vermont because there is a very mixed, we are a spectrum when it comes to African-American. We are shade upon shade upon shade. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we, um, um, we, we colorism happens. You know, if, if, if someone is of one shade, they're acceptable. If someone is of another shade, they're acceptable. If someone is of that shade, they're a little too dark. If someone is too light, they don't qualify and they're white. And this is across the country, but here in Vermont, where people don't really have a, a, a connection or an understanding of African-American community, there's a lot of um, unintentional, I wanna say, I wanna say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call it this. I will call it racism out of ignorance and inexperience. I, it's not like I'm in North Carolina. There's a lot of racism here that is generational and active and, and taught with intent. And I think what happens in Vermont a lot of times is people say, you know, I like everyone. Um, black people are wonderful. And then that's based on having no experience. And when you meet someone and you, you, and, experience that a different person a different culture um it, it it rubs against your idea of who they are and what they see who we are and what we should be so um i i don't want just like i meet people of different cultures and i take them as individuals recognizing who they are culturally and 
you know, not all Vermonters are the same. Farmer Fred down the road is not the same as my friends that I know in Burlington. And, and we are different, which means there's a richness to us and taking the time to get to know each of us is important. And someone was asking about schools. How do you get your school boards and your teachers involved? I think the whole thing that, that these students are doing, um, creating cougars of color, talking to the students, creating an office opportunity for students in schools to get together and, and create a clubs or, or just putting out a list of books that, that maybe we can include in the curriculum, or maybe we should just, you know, book clubs and having, having, you know, teachers encourage the reading of that material. I think, you know, we as adults need to listen to their experiences in order to make differences and changes in our school system. You know, and it's not like, yay, hip, I remember when African History Month happened, oh, that's so great. But it's not African history, it's American history. And as long as we keep teaching it as a separate thing, nobody will invest in it. It should be celebrated, but it cannot be taught only as separate. And that's my feeling. We've be gone beyond that. We've gone beyond where we need to recognize that there is a history. We need to, rec now everyone needs to claim it. And when, you know, we've talked about the N word and how a lot of people use it because they don't know the history. So, yeah. That, that, and I'm really proud of you. And one more thing, Serena, Zoe just walked up the stairs, so she's here. Ah, thank you. Thank you for your input. I have a question to ask of Serena and Daniel. And let me preface this question by saying because I know I know that one of my sons is 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 on is listening in as well. Um, my children grew up in a predominantly white environment to the point that when when we took a trip down south mm. and we happened to stop at a restaurant in Huntsville, Alabama, which is a northern part of Alabama, it was, there were a lot of African Americans, a lot of black people in, in the place. And I noticed that one of my sons was rather nervous about that. And afterwards, I asked him why. And he said, I had never been around so many Black people in my life. So I realized that growing up in a predominantly white state, surrounded by mostly white people, having very few experiences of people like you, first of all, I wonder if there's kind of a, an exhale when you find yourself among other students of color in your cougar or color community that you can finally kind of be yourself? That's one question. This next question is, when you graduate from high school, if you decide to go on to college, would you consider a predominantly black college to just see to just what it's like to be in an environment where most of the people look like you, talk and experience, uh, have a similar experience. Well, I shouldn't even say that, that they would have a similar experience because some of those students, some of those students of color will come from environments like yours here in Vermont. And so their experiences will not be the same. But would you consider a predominant, among the among the schools that you that you look at, would you consider a a predominantly black school? Um, I mean, funnily enough, earlier today, I think I actually talked. I might have been yesterday, but I talked to my mom about this a little while ago, and uh, yeah, I, I would. I don't think it'd be. I don't think I'd go to a school specifically because it was predominantly black, mm -hmm. but I do think that if it came down to two schools, like as my favorite, as for my top picks, I think that might be a factor that I would like, I think that would be a factor that I would keep in mind because I do think it would be pretty cool to be around more than, I mean, right now that I'm around zero black people on a daily basis, but, um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. 
I guess. And I, hold on. I'm getting messages that my sound is hard to hear. So I am going to. Am I better now? I do not know. I can hear you more. Okay. So, um, I guess, yeah, it's not, it wouldn't be the deciding factor, but I do think it would be, um, I do think it would be a big influence on what school I may choose to go to. Mm-hmm. That is relatively far away, I guess. Thank you, Daniel. Serena. Um, yes. Um, to the first question about cougars of color. It is so nice. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the time we judge we we judge other clubs on like their effectiveness based on numbers. And the amount of people that we have varies widely. Last spring we were decking like a dozen and dozen plus per meeting and sometimes sometimes it's like me and two other people. But whatever it is, it is such a relief because all the things in your mind just sort of build up after a while. And I find myself, sometimes I take it out on the people that I might be upset with. Um, and so it's so nice. It is, I encourage every school to try and do something like that. Um, even if it's only a couple of students attending because it's just as powerful. Um, and as for the college thing, I would definitely, I would definitely like to experience something different than the, um, than the ratio happening here. I think, I think like Daniel said, if it came down to two colleges, one being predominantly black and the other not, I would, I would definitely um, consider leaning towards the predominantly black college. Yeah, if only because I'm so interested in this idea of like, black culture and what it is because I have no semblance of it at this point like I've seen what people see on tv I've heard people talk about it I hear my cousins um but I've never really experienced it and it might cause another identity crisis but it might be cool (laughs) and um and it's definitely something that I'm looking to experience at some point so yeah definitely that's a great question you should also know that I have raised this question to whites as well, because as the demographics of this nation changes, I think a lot of white people would dip benefit applying to predominantly black schools because they would, they would have the experience of being a minority and a majority and a, and a majority culture and gain some sensitivities from that. And I think as the, as the country gradually becomes browner and browner, uh, we're going to have to acclimate ourselves to those new demographics. And in that uh, Americans, that white Americans, still the majority of the majority of whom still do not have significant relations with people of color. Uh, I think it just accents the divisions that we are now facing. And also the kind of abuses that you now and then face among people who unintentionally will say and do things that are offensive. Other questions? I'm interested in hearing from people out there. There's a lot of questions about schools. Like there's a question about what class they wish they had at MMU. Um, And then there's a question from Devin Thomas about their place at MMU, if you'd like to ask yourself, perhaps. So the question from Devin is, do you feel there is a place at MMU or your community that helps you build your black identity or have you had to do that work outside of your community? Yeah, I, I think, I think I'm, I think I'm, actively trying to build that in the school I think um I think that's kind of why I started Cougars of Color obviously not just for black people but just for the I the sake of having an identity is I think identity is so often built around those around you and your environment um and I 
I mean, I definitely look towards outward community for it as well, but I, I've found very little of it in, <laughs> in, um, in Vermont's community, many communities, um, because of our few BIPOC, um, but I have to say after, um, after meeting Pastor Thomas, I definitely feel so much more connected to these sorts of communities. And I also, I, I think I look for it in any place that I can. You know, I'll hear stories of like my cousins in North Carolina and I'll sort of latch onto that. Like you hear that? That's black <laughs> right there. <laughs> and I, um, I, I think I try and find it any way I can. I think we're slowly starting to um, at least get used to the idea of having like a, a, a black culture or a not white culture at our school, it was hard to sell um, a club that didn't include white people. But I think, I think we're slowly like digging it with handfuls at a time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I have a comment from Linda Gray. It says for allyship, you might look at the allies who provide safe spaces for rape victims or LB, LGBTQ persons. There are actually signs on the doors of faculty members who are trained to be allies. And then there's a, a comment from Elise Gayet, who is a Vermont historian, who says, I find that ignorance of our history is a major problem. Is there a movement to change the history curriculum in your school? Do you sense that? Daniel, um, I don't know if you've taken this class yet, um, but there's one class. I've spoken to many alumni from MMU and there's only one class that um, that people feel is is properly taking steps towards an honest history. And that is one honors history class that people typically take in 10th grade. Um, and I took it and, and I really appreciate it. I learned so much from it. I really, I really appreciated that that step is being taken. And I find it kind of confusing because that class has existed for a long time and no other history classes that I've experienced have learned anything or taking any tips from that particular course. Um, so I'm definitely looking to expand that into other courses and create like an independent study based off of that. But at the moment, it's sort of contained, I would say. Daniel, do you agree? Yeah, it is. I, yeah, completely agree with that I think you would um, you would find some wonderful resources in the wider community, and I when I say that I I I think of um, resources from the University of Vermont and from neighboring colleges like possibly um, uh, Northern Vermont University or Vermont Technical College, um, Saint Michael's Champlain College that would be glad to uh, uh, teach courses um, that would include more representation of African-Americans. And this is not just history courses. This, is, should, this should be uh, uh, other topics, other, other, um, other disciplines in which African-Americans have contributed, but we just know very little about. Yeah, I actually, before you go on, I just want to mention one more thing. Um, I, this summer, me and, a, me and an alumni um, built a course called Alumni Teaching Anti-Racism or something like that. Um, and we had like, I think I had 70-ish students sign up for it which is super crazy. So we had 70 students taking eight week courses talking about an honest, um, an honest, not whitewashed his version of our history. Um, so that happened, but in terms of the actual school curriculum, that wasn't connected to that. So not really. Dad, can I butt in here? 
uh, because I do feel a little bit like I should defend myself because <laughs> I was the the child the kid that he was talking about in his story and um, there was a bit of intentionality behind my asking that question um, because I do feel um, also as a graduate of MMU though almost 20 years now um, you know a lot of that discomfort that I felt um, during that trip down to Alabama. Um, and I think a lot of the discomfort and confusion that um, I feel, you know, that I've heard Daniel and Irina talking about, um, I think that that's one of the things that I've really had to struggle with is just the complete lack of power that I've had um, looking back growing up about, um, you know, in, in building my own identity. Um, you know, for most living in a predominantly white community all my life, I've continually been continuously been told um, what it is, what it means to be black um, or, or, or what black is. And as a result, I think um, that that sense of confusion is um, something that um, I, I, I think it's something to something to be expected. I think here in Vermont, um, a lot of folks see you as black and they expect you to know who you are. Um, they expect you to be able to give that sort of the end bomb pass. They expect you to know what's offensive and what's not offensive. Um, not really paying attention, and this is not just peers, this is teachers as well. Um, and they expect you to be an expert on yourself. Um, but there are so few resources to build a black identity here in Vermont. Um, and it's so challenging to do that. Often you have to go somewhere else in order to do it. Um, if I didn't find myself in a predominantly black um, living envi you know, environment in New York City, um, I don't know if I ever would have for myself. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm so, I really in so many ways, I'm very envious of you, Daniel and Sirena for um, having that that, that club at school, because um, I think that that is so very important. And I, you know, I wish that um, I, I wish that my own black identity were more important to me when I was in high school, um, so that I would have been able to see, seek it out a lot, a lot sooner. I think we really do need to put an effort behind um, giving people of color the resources to engage with their own identity here in the state. And that goes beyond just being black or BIPOC. Um, I think one of the things we really lack is giving people of color the ability to build a, a, a identity here in Vermont that's not white. Thank you, Devin. One more question before we close. Is there one more question? Okay, there we yeah, go. There you go. Um, I was just going to to look at it from the other side because I'm incurably white. But <laughs> my young my youngest son, uh, his father died when he was three, so it was just the two of us, and I made a sort of a deliberate effort to raise him uh, in another culture. First, we went to Germany for a while when he was five, and so he was the outsider there for a year and then when we came back we moved to St. Louis and I took he started in first grade then in a little school that was almost entirely black and after a couple of days he came home from school and I said how is school today and he said they don't like me I said what do you mean they don't like you? he said they call me names oh I said what do they call you honky <laughs> so I said, yeah, well, that's not so bad. They'll, they'll get used to you. And sure enough, you know, after two years there, he was on the soccer team and the least apt of the lot. But anyway, he had a good time. And when we moved then back to Germany, uh, he immediately bonded with the African kids. And they were his favorite playmates and so on. <clears throat> so he's gone, gone through life uh, not not being an outsider, even if he was an outsider, <clears throat> and really not letting other people be outsiders either. 
um, when he came, when we moved to California here and he went to work with an architecture firm in Sacramento, uh, there was another guy there <clears throat> who was his twin brother. They were both, <clears throat> he and, and his friend were both born <clears throat> on the same day in the same year. Only his friend was born in Kenya. So there, there are ways to be not bicultural, but at least to be at home with other people if you start early enough. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. that's a wonderful example of a white, a white child working and adjusting to a predominantly black environment as far as St. Louis was concerned. Mm -hmm. Good example. Yeah. I wanna thank everyone of you for participating in this forum and there'll be plenty more to come. Um, next month, we have a wonderful treat, uh, a theater group from Harlem that I got to know very well while I was uh, serving the Riverside Church in Harlem. Um, the group is called Shades of Truth. And for um, a celebration of uh, Martin Luther King's birthday, uh, they will be presenting a um, production that was created by that theater company, by the director of the theater company. His name is Michael Green, about the first assassination attempt on Martin Luther King's life back in 19. 58 and how Harlem uh, um, actually was the community that that saved his life and so it's called if I if I had only sneezed and uh, it will be presented I can't rem I I can't remember the date but uh, um, for those of you who are on the email list and for those of you who are with on this uh, on this uh, email contact list, you should you should have the the date of the next uh, forum, and um, and for those of you who don't, I will make sure you get that information. So that will be in January. Yes, as you also know that in our November forum, and we were rudely interrupted by uh, by an intruder, a racist intruder. And in exiting that person from the forum, we accidentally exited one of our speakers. And so Keisha Rahm, who is a newly elected state senator from Chittenden County, the first, uh, the first person of color, female person of color to serve as a senator, she will be back with us uh, later on that month in January, along with a few other newly elected state officials and uh, they're going to share uh, some thoughts about the future of Vermont from their perspective. And I think we're gonna be including not just Democratic, but Republican newly elected officials as well. So I hope you'll join us. We're gonna continue the conversation of, of race relations as it affects Vermont. And uh, we have much in store and I hope you stay involved. So thank you for joining us and Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Daniel, uh, and everyone else who has participated in this forum. Can I make one really, really quick closing remark? You sure can. Okay, so I posted a link in the chat. It is to a um, it is to a Google site made by recently recent graduate of Fairfax High School, um, and his name is Moses Delane, and he is a recent graduate he's a black student and this site is amazing i wish he could have spoken here but i didn't get him in in time um but i encourage everyone to check it out we will do that, that we'll do yeah. That. yeah thanks again thank you everyone thank you have a nice evening and have thank a you. happy holidays <laughs>